<laughs> hey, uh, day four, Stock Lecture Tuesdays today, guys. Uh, cool stuff. We're looking at alternative investments. Uh, getting into it, we've got commodities, ETFs, mutual funds, and we can talk a little bit about currencies. Uh, ETFs and mutual funds, great long-term stuff, guys. Passive, get your hands off of it. Just let other people deal with it. Um, cool stuff. We'll get into it. Talk about the commodities market. Talk about pretty much everything else you can get into with paper assets. I hope you guys enjoy. Learn a lot. All right, we got like one minute. We'll see who shows up. Everything should be fine. Um, cool. I'll move this out of the way. We get to talk about commodities, ETFs, and stuff today, which is just the dream. This is going to be mimicking our market performance that we talked about last week and trying to get the performance again. And commodities are a little bit of a different thing we'll talk about for just a second. So, markets, this is just finance. And we're going to go to top ETFs, commodities, and mutual funds. Jesus. All right, let's start with commodities. So, commodities are going to be your gold, basically future contracts for natural resources. So gold, silver, platinum, copper, there's, there's, there's so many of them. But if you can think of it, it's probably here. Natural gas, orange juice, soybeans. These are going to be your crops that you grow. And the reason that these commodities are on the market are so that farmers can lock in futures contracts where they can say, I'll grow this much corn or whatever, and I use somebody on the market's gonna have to buy it at this locked in price. And we can see if we look, uh, you know, they, it's just like a stock. We can go to goldprice.org and that'll show us, you know, the historic performance of gold. Uh, gold, probably the most known one from it, but let's see. You can see this is how the price of gold is trended over 20 years. Uh, it's not really. Uh, futures, as we've talked about before, uh, and I think Buffett said the same thing, they aren't going to outperform the market in the long term. But in the short term, you can make some good medium to short term trades on these sometimes. And with the futures contracts, they're usually more medium term. And you can make medium terms you think the price of gas is going to go up. I think the price of corn is going to go up, and usually with like natural disasters or something. We saw orange juice prices go up a lot because of the uh, hurricanes in Florida. So they're more, vol not really volatile. I mean, a lot of them, let's look at like the history of orange juice prices or gas prices, probably is a better one. Uh, crude oil price history. We'll see something like this. And you can see this is relating directly to how much people pay for gas. You look, you know, at all time. That is all time. So, you know, gas prices got really high, uh, and then people learned how to make it. Now they're rising up again. If we look just a little bit more at the shorter term, like maybe a 10 year chart, or 20 years, we can see, you know, the price of it all lately. That's going to affect direct consumers. Like, consumers are paying more for gas, they're paying more for orange juice for corn for anything that's going to be traded on a futures exchange now these exchanges are going to be like your wall street or um, not your, your like nasdaq futures exchange cme futures exchange and you'll go and you can buy your futures contracts and the contracts you just buy them or you can short futures too uh and you just put in a sell order it's just like anything else in the market up or down uh these are your raw materials they're good for if you have like some speculative pick you want to make on a some sort of item. Maybe you think silver, there's a bunch of silver coming out or something. But these aren't really going to be a big part of a long-term portfolio. These are more or less just medium-term picks off of if you really think something's going to move. But other than that, these are just more for industry users and people that are growing these or selling these or mining these or whatever. This is not going to be a huge investment part of most portfolios. So let's go over to ETFs. So we looked at market performance with our three major index funds and some of the other less uh, popular indexes or indices last week. 
Uh, these ETFs are gonna try to target the index funds. So some of these, uh, the S&P 500, it's just an index fund, or an ETF, which tries to mimic the S&P 500. An ETF is an exchange traded fund. Uh, it's like, the main difference, you got ETFs and mutual funds. Mutual funds are privately managed. ETFs are privately managed. You'll have company like Claymore, uh, Spider, Power Shares. They have their own firms and they manage the ETF or the index fund. For both of these investments, you're gonna pay fees in one way or another. With ETFs, you have to pay to buy it. It's an extreme traded fund, so you buy it on a market, you pay fees to whatever exchange, and that's how you acquire it. But with mutual funds, it's not open on a market. You go straight through the company, and you go to whatever company it is, and you say, I wanna buy this fund, I want to, sell this fund and the prices for ETFs are live they're updated with the market intraday but for mutual funds those are not they're updated at the end of the day all their prices are updated uh, ETFs are gonna be usually better because it's easier to get in and out of them because you don't have to contact anybody you can just sell it on an open exchange and it's easier to get into them too you don't have to open an account with uh, you know fidelity you know, if you trade on TD Ameritrade or something, you have to open a Fidelity account if you want to get one of these Fidelity sector uh, mutual funds. But with ETFs, you just buy it on exchanges and you're A-OK. -okay. So a lot of these funds, like some of them are at the S&P, they try to get the S&P. Some of these ETFs, we see S&P insurance right here, uh, large cap, banks, uh, systematic growth, regional banking. Those are going to be sector dependent funds. So if you think a certain sector is going to outperform or even if you just want separate sectors to diversify your portfolio, uh, you know, if you have a lot of tech stocks, maybe you want to get into some banking stocks, some large cap, uh, more blue chip stocks and get a little bit diversified because we're talking about diversification next week, but that's going to be really important. So with these, some of them will cover the whole market and then some of them will cover just a sector of the market. And if the sector of the market does well, usually those stocks do well and ETF does well. So the ETF and the mutual fund, they're all just made up of stocks. And usually, or mutual uh, ETFs and I think mutual funds, they can also have like futures trades in them or stock option trades in them, which are gonna be more active management with uh, the firm itself, which usually means you'll pay a higher fee to be part of the ETF for the fund. Uh, but most of them, you're just gonna see them made up of stocks. And the stocks in them might change. Sometimes they change really a lot. Sometimes they only change every year. It really just depends on the fund and who's managing it. Uh, the ones that they change the stocks more often, they put more into it, that's gonna have higher fees and you'll pay that with your ETFs uh, and your mutual funds. And the ones that they just balance it every year, like the S&P mimicking funds, they'll just have the companies in the S&P used sometimes. And those will just, they'll be lower fees because it's just the fund. It's, you're just buying the fund. And the reason you'll go for an ETF or a mutual fund is you can get, you know, 500 stocks. Uh, some of these mimic the NASDAQ 100, so 100 stocks. You can get all that and you only have to make one trade, which is just great because it's, you know, 100 trades is going to have a lot of commissions on a normal broker. But with an ETF, you just buy it and in, buy into the fund. And then sometimes it's a small fee, but it's nowhere near what it would be to be like buy 100 different stocks instead of just buying like a QQQ NASDAQ 100 mimicking fund. Uh, another benefit with ETFs and mutual funds is they're just, they're, a lot of them, they'll do better than just their equally weighted stocks. So let's look at one, for example, I know the QQQ has been performing very well. The QQQ is a fund managed by PowerShares and it mimics the NASDAQ. So the, re the way it does this is we looked at, um, I think last week performance history, maybe before that. We saw, you know, the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow 30, the Russell, uh, you know, more of these index funds we'll see up here. We saw that the NASDAQ was a really good performer and doing better than the other funds. So the QQQ tries to mimic the NASDAQ um, and it does a very good job. They're an ETF and the way they do it is just like any other mutual fund, they take a basket of stocks. I think QQQ right now has like 103 stocks. It's just a little bit over than the, greater than the NASDAQ 100, uh, but it has unequal distribution, right? So. Certain stocks are worth more, certain stocks are worth less. We talked about weighting earlier. Uh, this is gonna be, most of these funds 
are weighted in a way that will diversify risk and give you better gains. Now, there are funds like the QPQE, uh, they're equally weighted. So if you just want to get into these top 100 companies for the NASDAQ, but you don't want to um, you know, put in 100 trades, you can buy the equally weighted fund. Uh, usually, you have to look side by side, and you're going to see different performance with different funds. So uh, it's really based on you with the pick, but it, these ETFs are great because you're buying all of these stocks, which greatly diversifies your risk because you don't just have, you know, this is an ETF might just be like one part of your, your one position, but the one position is diversified over, you know, a hundred different stocks, which is, or 500 different stocks, which is terrific for, you know, managing risk. You'll have a lot less risk. Uh, and you're going to do a, these are going to follow the overall market. So you'll have less variability. You don't have to worry about, you know, does this stock, that stock. If you just get into, you know, maybe a couple separate ETFs, maybe one that mimics the, the NASDAQ, one that mimics the, uh, the S&P, the Dow Jones, blah, blah, blah. You know, these are all professionally managed, so you don't have to really do any work. You just put your money in there, and it's passively done. Vanguard, they have people that manage their funds and manage the balancing. And the funds do all the work for you. You just follow the market because the funds will do the market performance. Uh, most of the time, that's their goal is to do the market. Uh, some of them are more aggressive, more risky. You know, the power QQQ. Uh, I think it's like QTD. QQQ. Yeah, pro shares QQQ. Uh, these are going to be more aggressive funds. So specifically with the Nasdaq 100, uh, there's the pro shares QQQ. Uh, and there's, you know, there's, there's a whole list of these funds and all of these funds, some of them try to get better gains in the market, right? So, uh, maybe corporate bonds, energy, small caps, corporate bonds, these are all, uh, sector specific funds. So if you want to get into certain sectors, but you don't want to buy, you know, all the stocks in the sector, maybe you don't know which stocks to buy in the sector can just buy an ETF and that'll have, you'll be in the sector. You'll have shares of whatever the fund manager sees as the best opportunities in that sector. And you can diversify, you know, get different ones. Uh, but most of them are gonna go for that overall market or market sector performance. Now you'll see funds that try to beat the performance. Maybe they have a daily goal of doubling some kind of fund or the index. Those funds, obviously, bigger returns, you're getting a little more risky. So maybe more upside, more downside. Uh, it's just risk management. Uh, most of these ETFs are more the safe ones, but there are some that are riskier that seek higher returns. And they'll very clearly say, this is a high return fund, be advised, blah, 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 blah. Uh, makes sense. These ETFs are basically just big baskets of stocks. And it really, just takes the guesswork, takes the word. I mean, it's a lot easier to get into this stuff because you just get into the big ones. And, you know, if the market goes down, they'll go down, it goes up, they'll go up. The sector goes down, it goes down, the sector goes up. They trade it on an exchange, so you can liquidate it any time when the market's open. And the prices are all, as you can see, updating constantly, intraday. So, mutual funds. These are a little more, a little more personal. So you're gonna have specific accounts with whoever you get mutual funds from: Fidelity, Darnum, BlackRock, Vanguard. These are all big people. Uh, most of the mutual funds aren't gonna be market wide. These mutual funds which are managed and you'll pay your fees and you have to go straight through them uh, through your whatever broker it is or exchange you're gonna have more sector dependent funds so if we look at the top ones here semiconductors biotech uh, it, biotech ultra sensor oil and gas uh, global tech life sciences these i mean a dividend investor that's a little more spread out but most of these are going to be seeking returns for some sort of specific thing. So if you like biotech, 
but you don't know the biggest biotech stocks or something. You could get into, you know, whatever mutual fund that does biotech, and you can look at, you know, their performance just like everybody else. There you go. Just like everyone else, they're gonna have their history on Yahoo Finance, and you can look more specifically at the parts of the fund and how the fund is built up through the fund manager's website, and they'll have the positions of the fund every quarter, they'll do like their dividends and how they're doing with it, blah, blah, blah. They should send you reports pretty frequently, how the fund goes versus the overall market. Uh, Morningstar's rating company, rating companies are just companies, they're, you know, like uh, MCO, Moody's Corporation, you know, these rating agencies, they'll take like, you know, a little small fee and they will rate uh, a bond, uh, a mutual fund, blah, blah, blah. These guys make money, they just rate things based off of their risk, versus returns over time. Uh, this is just an example of Moody's Corporation. This is an individual stock, obviously. Uh, but that's kind of one of the rating companies. So that's where we get these numbers here on Yahoo Finance. We see their sustainability, their Morningstar risk, Morningstar rating, uh, cap gain category, which is big with these, uh, and then expense ratio. So your specific fees for mutual funds and ETFs should be outlined on the website or whatever the fund provider is. Uh, with ETFs, it's a little less to worry about because you just trade them on an exchange. But with mutual funds, you're definitely going to want to look, especially with long-term. For long-term, for ETFs or mutual funds, both of those you're going to be looking at the fund uh, fees. And especially when you're comparing between two very similar funds, you might say, okay, this fund has less fees. Maybe we'll go with this one instead of the other one. Uh, fees to look out for, management fees, trade fees are the big ones. So maybe every year do they charge you a management fee? Every time they rebalance the position, the uh, the fund, you know, if they change it a lot, are they going to charge you trade fees for the active managers? You know, they got to pay the people that are managing it, obviously. So there are going to be fees somewhere, and usually the funds will also say exactly, you know, what how much money they have in position X, Y, Z, blah, 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 and their whole fund should have some sort of report where it says what percent of the fund, how much money is in, you know, whatever stock, and it'll have all the stocks they have, all the assets they have, all the cash they have. And then you get to know your fund, you trust your fund, it's very important. And then you can see, okay, well, good job, they're doing their best for, you know, biotech in the health industry. Uh, they're trying to mimic the market. Most of the bigger ETFs are gonna be mimicking the overall market, but then you do have the ETFs that go into specifics. Uh, and some of the ETFs, like, I know there was an oil one. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, thousands of them. So we can go on and on. Uh, but some of them will look at commodities. So maybe a fund tries to base itself off natural gas, natural gas companies, natural gas suppliers, sellers, blah, blah, blah. And we could see commodities integrated into ETFs and mutual funds in that way. Uh, it's a way to get into the commodities without actually being in the price of the commodity. So if you want to be a part of the people that sell oil rather than the price of oil, you could get an ETF or mutual fund based off of that specific industry, which is really what mutual funds are great for, specific industries. And ETFs overall market is the main goal with those. Both of ETF, ETFs and mutual funds are long-term, pretty much. They're, they're usually long-term. Uh, you're gonna see market returns, and market returns are long-term returns. You're not really gonna, there's some of them that do try to beat the market, and those, uh, you know, so a lot of time they have really good traders, so they do really well at it. Um, but for the ones that are beating the market, those obviously have more risk, so maybe you're not gonna hold that as long-term. But like, I mean, you know, Schwab US mid-cap ETF, you know, just a random ETF. Like these things, oh no. Okay, we're good. Oh, no, we're not good. These things are going to do good in the long term because they're diversified. They have a wide range of companies. I mean, this is the Russell 2000 index. And I can't go back, which stinks. But we can see in the long term, this is, you know, 2000 stocks. And the gains and losses, you know, some companies do bad, some companies do well. But as long as overall everyone does better than the ones who do bad, then the fund's gonna go up. All right, let's see. What's let's go up and, uh, There you go. 
So, yeah, random fun. We can look at ones that mimic the S&P 500. Those are just gonna do, you know, general market performance. Uh, and then more specific ones might look at more specific sector performance. So if a sector outperforms the overall market, obviously the fund can do better. If a sector underperforms the overall market, obviously it's not gonna do as well. So we can see here we have um, select, uh, this is an ETF from material select, oh, Spider. So, you know, this is a pretty niche fund. Uh, the chart's not working, unfortunately. But you can see, just like with normal stocks, you've got your close, your opens, your major ass, uh, your ranges, volume, uh, and a little bit more stuff, but not too big. These are the assets and the management on. So just like a normal stock with the ETFs, you're gonna see your daily, people are bidding and uh, people are selling to the bidders, buying from the sellers. And it's just like a normal stock. You've got the price movement intraday. You've got your trading intraday. As with mutual funds though, these are privately managed and you have to go straight through a fund manager and the price is calculated at the end of the day and any order placed in our day is gonna execute at the end of the day. So those are obviously much more long-term because you simply can't trade them intraday. Uh, and with these ETFs, as the chart's gonna work, we can see long-term, you know, most of them, this is the S&P 500, equally weighted. So equally weighted, sometimes it does better, sometimes it does worse, it really just depends on the fund. I know the power shares S&P equally weighted been doing pretty well in the past 10 years. Uh, but you just get in this fund, you know, whenever, and you pick, you know, different funds. You don't put everything in one fund. You always diversify. I'll talk about diversification later. Um, but just pick, like, you know, things you like. I mean, if you like tech, get in the tech. Uh, the NASDAQ is all about tech. And we see the Dow Jones. Those are more, you know, big, you know, blue collar companies, big companies. You get in the Dow Jones. It's just... You know, you really, it's tough to do poorly with these ETFs, most of them. I mean, unless you're looking at inverse ETFs, which try to do the opposite of the market return, I mean, usually stay away from those because if the market goes up, the fund will go down. And in the long term, the market has historically, you know, if we look, we looked at performance earlier, it's always gone up over time historically. So we're not going to see any loss that way. So by looking at these ETFs, and mutual funds, we can get better long-term growth and just not really have to worry that much about managing it because we have other people managing it for us. It's a much more hands-off, passive approach and you're gonna get, you know, a safer investment. And a safe investment is important because, you know, 40 years or, you know, 20 years from now, when you've got, you know, all your, all your money you've worked for, blah, 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 you're gonna want it in you know, safer stuff. Maybe you'll have less of your stuff in straight stocks, more of it in safer stuff, which makes complete sense because you're having like, these are professional managers, Fidelity, huge, right? So they're managing it for you, which is great. Uh, yeah, ETFs, mutual funds and commodities. They're just a little bit under this markets tab in Yahoo Finance. Uh, yeah. We're not talking about crypto in this course, even though I would love to. I just cannot in seven minutes, unfortunately. Uh, currencies, we'll talk about a little next week. They're not, I mean, we could get them out of the way, why not? So, I mean, obviously different countries have different currencies. And, oh my god, no way, they have crypto on here too, huh? Well, we have seven minutes, let's get into currencies, why not? So, countries have different currencies. I mean, you guys know this, uh, you know, British pound, Japanese yen, the euro, blah, 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 Jamaican. Countries have different uh, different currencies. Uh, I guess, oh, uh-oh. -uh. This is all Yahoo Finance shows, which is totally cool. So these are all USD paired currencies. So, you know, like the Canadian dollar, blah, blah, blah. Those are traded on 
forex exchanges or foreign exchanges. So you'll trade, you know, a thousand U.S. dollars for a thousand dollars of currency, blah blah blah. Um, and usually these are going to be more active positions. These are not usually long-term investments. And a very important thing to remember with these currencies is the inflation principle, right? So let's just um, let's go over the overall. So these are all USD pairings. We've got the euro to the USD, the USD to the Japanese yen, British pound, Australian dollar, New Zealand, blah, blah, blah. These are all just different countries' currencies. And anyone here, we can go to a foreign exchange broker. And let's just pick uh, the euro for simplicity, because that's easier. We can look maybe at the five-year chart, right? So we can see that in 2013, uh, one euro was a dollar. 30 and you know hit lows of a dollar uh, or I think that's a dollar yeah, about a dollar ten uh, what a lot of people will do is more this is you know this is more about politics and the power of a government in whatever country this is uh, the euro so maybe the German British town would be a better thing to look at for this but what you're basically trading is First of all, volatility, because these are definitely volatile, but they aren't usually as volatile as stocks, right? So with um, foreign exchanges and trading currencies, you're going to see a lot of people taking on leverage, and leverage is when you say to a broker, I have a grand, give me four to one leverage, and they'll give you four grand to trade. Uh, Guys, stay away with long term. I mean, long term is obviously you don't have to worry about it because you're not using leverage for long term. That's all your money. But for these short term positions and maybe swing trades for medium terms, stay away from leverage because you lose a broker's money, you're paying it back and it's debt accumulating. You don't want to mess with that stuff. Never risk more than you can afford to lose with you know any of this. You always want to keep it real. Never go too far in because if you get in debt to a broker and then you start to get uh, start to get leverage calls and they say you have to sell this position to pay back X percent of the money you borrowed from us you don't want to be in that situation so a lot of people because you know this is less usually these you know 0.2 percent blah 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 this is less volatile than I'm gonna ignore the first two because that's crypto that doesn't count these are usually less volatile than stocks so people will take up leverage in them and they'll take up leverage in stocks too to leverage their money and put down more money than they have with the security behind themselves of the money they already put down. So you could put in like $100 and make a $1,000 position. And if you lose 20%, well, that's $200 gone. So you just put yourself in debt to a broker. So leverage is basically debt for trading given to you by a brokerage. And they give it to people to make themselves money when people lose it. Uh, and usually, you know, if you make a winning trade off leverage, I think you'll pay like a little small percent back to the broker too. But people can make a lot of money really quickly with leverage, but it's, it's just, you don't want to risk. You know, you never really know with any of these individual positions or even marketplace. I mean, the market could go down for five years. No one knows, right? You never really want to mess with investing with debt. It's just not, not a good plan, not a good thing to do. Uh, Let's see, how deep can we get into currencies? Let's see, German British pound, right? Okay. So, this is a trading pair between the US dollar and the German British pound. We can see that every German British pound buys a dollar thirty-five US dollars. So I mean you have a hundred pounds, that's like a hundred and thirty-five bucks, right? So what people will do, let's go to more of a candlestick chart and like a five day chart with like a uh, 15 minute interval. We can see there's a lot of volatility here and when people, and this volatility is simply people exchanging currencies. So you have people that sell their British pounds for dollars, that's gonna make your price go down. You have people buy your British pounds with dollars, that's gonna make your price go up. So it's just sellers going down, buyers going up. Uh, this is more of an international exchange of sorts, and it's just people exchanging value with the currencies. Now, you can definitely play these, and you can use foreign exchange to, uh, hey man, 
to trade off of these currencies and make your gains. But I mean, especially if you look at the long term, like this is just a tough pattern to trade overall, and we're not going to see overall trends with these. And especially with you know, basically every currency, you just don't see trends uh, as much in the long term. Of course, in the short term, you can game it and play it for short to medium term, but it's not just for long. We'll talk more about this next week, guys. We're out of time. Cool. Fun stuff. ETS mutual funds, good to be in long term. Commodities, always look at those for shorter term, faster movements. You know, maybe in the six month range, something around that sort. Probably make this go to sleep. Alright. Go on tomorrow with charts and stuff. Make we're doing indicators and good old trend analysis.